everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Guile Treatment. Uh, today we have, I would say, the most decorated UFS player. I would say. Right, Garrett? Are you the most decorated right now? Uh, I think I am. I okay. think the second most is still seven, and I have 11. Okay. Uh, okay. Pieces of cardboard, I wow. guess. You know, okay. close, close. You can build a house out of it this, is, it, is, it is close, but... Uh, <laughs> I believe uh, Rob reached out, or it was either vice versa, some correspondence. Well, he, yeah, he and I were sort of talking, and like, and he's like, "Well, you know, if you ever want me to come on," I was like, "Well, <laughs> yes. <if> you're offering." <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I, I, I watch your guys' show. Um, part of me likes. You cut out. I ah, froze. Did he freeze? No, it's start over. <laughs> he froze. No. Okay, so I'll have to start over when we get him back. So, now oh, the entrance was so perfect. Hey, did I? Oh, you guys too. Yeah, you cut off. Yeah, you cut off a bit. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. It's okay. Uh, it works. It's. I, I think it's my new thing. Oh, okay. But anyways, yeah, no, I watch your show. I love it. Yep. Uh, Thanks. Like, if, if you ever need my comments, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to come on anytime. So. Oh, great. We have That's a. Pretty we have our we have our one year anniversary show coming up. No time like the present to get you back on. So, you know, um, so sure. go, so uh, go ahead, Rob, and uh, lead us off into the first topic of conversation. Uh, unless you want to have Garrett, inter- you know, talk about some of his accomplishments, if we want to do that. Well, I mean, I you know maybe he does. Do you want to? Do you want, uh, yeah, if you want to. No, you know, I hate. I, I think about I think people I think people know. Yeah, people know who Garrett Brett is. You, yes. can, you can find out. Yes. he's uh, yeah. he's got some. You know, a reputation, I guess. He, uh, he has some really cool cards. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, I, he has some really cool I cards. think, like, one of the, so one of the things um, that was really big to me after this um, Nationals, and I, because we, we talked about it on the pre show, you know, it was one of the topics where, like, you know, how many Luke Kangs are there going to be? How many Luke Kangs are going to get diversified? Like, you know, what's this going to be like? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think we were talking about, you know, it getting into, like, what, like, 2025 was going to be like getting into top 16 or something like that. And I think it ended up being like not a single Liu Kang was diversified. You know, there was a Cassie Mm -hmm. that was really close. I think there was a Cassie that was in like third place or fourth place that ended up getting cut. Yeah. Um, But everything else was really, you know, Uh, down and around like 14, 15. There was like a vicious, a Vega. Uh, Um, A Jackie. Jackie was diversified. I know that. Is that what? what did I, I don't know what I said. Yeah, you said yeah, Cassie, there was, but yeah, it was a. It was oh, a, I meant a Jackie. There was, yeah, was a Jackie. Jackie. It was really high. Yeah. Um, and if you look, like they they posted like the final standings, and if you look, basically after the cut, there's just a wall of like Liu Kangs, mm-hmm. um, that were all like four and three or like four two one something like that. And one of the big takeaways is that they just started scooping. Um, it was similar to, I think the first nationals I went to, uh, it was the Napalm man, uh, nationals. It, uh, I think it was the first one in Atlanta and, you know, Napalm man was everywhere and turbo man was everywhere. And that was kind of like, I mean, honestly, I think that was a saltier format than this was, <laughs> which is sort of surprising given like, you know, Liu Kang, mm-hmm. but like Kim was still around, like Ryu was still around, Chiff, you know, it was just, there was some, honestly, there were probably worse decks in that than like no. anything. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there were, I think about 14 or 15 Liu Kangs, or not Liu Kangs, <laughs> Turbo Man. And none of them made top cuts because all of them took like a loss or two in the mid rounds. And you know, thought to themselves, well, I'm not going to top because there's, you know, 14 other people here playing my character and they stopped playing and mm-hmm. then none of them got in and all like basically all one of them had to do was just say, I'm going to play it out and they would have gotten into tops. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I, I think that it's worse now. I think that the, the shift in power uh, that started with Bebop has sort of shown a bit of a light on the diversity rule and kind of its impact on just tournaments on tops. And I think in some ways it's, it's not even like the game. I think it's a little bit of the culture of UFS players. Um, I think it's a lot of people who, you know, they're there to have fun. They're there to hang out with their friends and, you know, nobody really thinks twice about just like giving away a win to somebody. Um, 
I think there's a little bit of it. I know just talking to people, there's like sort of this mentality of like, oh, well, you know, I'll do it for them because then, you know, someone will do it for me sometime. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. It's just such a weird, like, thought process, I guess. You know, it's sort of like, oh, I'll do it because, like, they'll owe me one. And it's like, well, when's the next time you're going to see this person in, like, a tournament? Yeah. (laughs) And they're going to be in a position to, like, return this favor? Like, it's not, I don't know. Um. And I guess on the flip side, um, we sort of have this, I guess, like running joke, if you will. It's not really a joke. It's kind of a, um, it's maybe even more of like a dig about like the integrity of results. results. Um, and, you know, we've talked about it a bit. And um, the one player I have like locally is Scott, like who I travel with a lot. He's almost like taking it to like this like extra level. I, I think it was Guelph this year, which was just such a small tournament. And he went to, and going into the last round, like he couldn't top because Tim Keefe was playing the same character and had like a better record than him. And he was basically like, you know, I drove eight hours or whatever to come up to Canada. And he's like, I'm not like, I'm at least going to get diversified because they were only cutting the top four. And so he played it out. I think he beat Phil Birch. Um, and it allowed like Kevin Broberg to get in at like the fourth seed. Um, and then I think he did it again in Rockford this year. Uh, he was playing like Thomas Gordon. I think again, like last round. Yeah. So it was again, Tim Keefe, he was in a diversity battle with jet <laughs> and he was not going to be able to make it in and they played it out. <laughs> you know, he won, reported it. And he ended up getting diversified, got his diversity prize. Thomas Gordon missed the cut by, like, just a bit. Um, I think you did that a little bit at uh, at Worlds, Chris. What? I think you played, like, do, you played some games with, like, Liu Kang, right? Where you yeah. I mean, were, like, far eliminated. Yeah, I uh, I ended up playing Phil, I think, like, in round four. And he's well, like, and he wanted me to scoop to him. And I was like, no, I want to play it out. And he got mad, and I beat him in three games. And... Then I, I played Mark the following round, who was in the hunt still, and he asked me to scoop to him, and I was like, no, because I want to exercise some demons, because I'd never beaten Phil in an event, I'd never beaten Mark in an event, and Mark ended up beating me, he ended up beating me fair and square, um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't scoop to people, I just don't, because it's, that has nothing to do with the integrity of results, it's the fact of the matter is that I'm there to play a game, I want to finish it out. If I get if I get diversified, that means I did the best I've ever done in a tournament, and that actually means something to me. I know I didn't top, but it means a lot personally as a player, and it's like a pride thing. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm. I mean, I'd say I, I'm not even gonna go that. I mean, yeah. I've scooped to somebody. Like yeah. I was out of something, and they had a sh- like outside shot at getting in tops, and I scooped um, in like the last round, and they didn't get in. I didn't, you know, I yeah. dropped out of. Uh, tops completely i've been scooped to um i've had people that or uh, you know were in uh, like they basically wanted to see how the last round was going to turn out the person who they were chasing won yeah and we had already played they like beat me and they went okay well i'm not going to get in but you know we'll fill out the slip like this way because it doesn't matter to me um no no i've, ID- I've id'd um obviously i actually one of the ids i wanted to play and the person like nah nah we'll get in i said okay Whatever. No, no. Just to hold, just to hold you I there. Like third Let's get Garrett like in ninth. on this. Let's get Garrett in on this because he you've, you've okay. done you've done a lot of talking. Let Garrett I, talk. Well, I know, and Garrett, I know, has some thoughts on ID. Yeah. Too. Yeah. So go ahead, Garrett. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and give us your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I've always been against IDing and scooping, or at least I always was, and it just gets to the point where you kind of have to do it, right? It's expected that you're going to do it with some people that you know really well or mm-hmm. whatever, right? Yeah. They want to be guaranteed that they're in a cut. Right. So it's the system that leads to this. It's the, the Swiss system. And the other thing that people don't think about is it's kind of like the, an immediate uh, result. Right. The person across from the table from you is immediately going to like you a bit more if you scoop to them or give them the win. But the thing is, you might have just kicked out your own friend yeah. who now isn't topping, but you weren't sitting across the table from him. Like mm-hmm. I've seen people do this before where they'll do that. And then the very next thing I hear is they're walking away from the table and their friend's like, oh, I missed the cut by this. And if he hadn't scooped to him, your better friend would have gone in, right? Yeah. People don't think about how it ruins, or it doesn't ruin, but it impacts everyone, yeah. right? It's kind of the thing that impacts everyone, um, whether you like it or not, and you can't tell who it's going to impact. 
Sure. So a lot of these people who scoop to other people think, oh, they're just doing something nice for this one person. But that's only the immediate thing. Every every time they're doing something nice for one person, they're doing something bad for at least one other person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't I think a lot of people don't think about that. And I think it's I think it's a bad mark on our community, actually. I think it's kind of it's not fun going into an event knowing that there's diversity plus this type of stuff is going to happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And the main reason for that is because it's how well known you are and how connected you are. Right. Like it's one thing to scoop to someone that you uh, know really well or traveled with or whatever. And you want one of you, one of you two to make a cut or something like that. Right. That happens all the time. But when in UFS, a lot of people travel all the time and a lot of people get really close and you got new players trying to compete and it just feels like an additional barrier to entry. And I think for those types of reasons, it needs to be addressed. Like I'm a big fan of diversity, but I, I'm not a bit, I'm not a big fan of some of the collateral damage of diversity. And I think this is the biggest piece of it. Mm-hmm. So um, what Rob said at the beginning, I think it's getting worse. And the reason it's getting worse, um, I'm surprised we didn't see it more with Bebop. And maybe we did. I just didn't uh, do much analysis at Worlds. But when you have a set with a very few characters that everyone's playing, it's bound to be more prevalent. Mm-hmm. And maybe this tournament we saw it more because Liu Kang... Uh, people were on Quan Chi. Some of them just jumped to Liu Kang. So you had even an even heavier concentration on one diversity issue. Yeah. Um, but I also think it's the type of characters that are in diversity battles. Um, I don't mean to be rude to any Liu Kang players, um, but I think it's fairly easy to pick it up and play. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the newer players and from bigger playgroups were playing it because they're with a big playgroup. They have older people in the playgroup who can who can see this Liu Kang deck and say, hey, this is something you can play because I know you're new. I have the cards for it. You should play it, right? Mm-hmm. And so here you get these newer players involved and further up the tables, and they're even more likely uh, to scoop or to uh, ID or get into situations where they're almost there but not quite there. And they also don't know, um, is it now the time to scoop or not? You know, And so there's all these added pressures to them. Mm-hmm. I, I just think it's something as a community, we need to be more aware of and talk about just for all the good things that could come if it, yeah. if it was removed. Mm-hmm. But um, I know that when I introduced new players to the tournament scene, like when we first had the Rockford PTC and I was talking to my guys who were there, I was like, just play out every round. Like if someone asks you to scoop, don't do it. Just play it. Cause you need that tournament experience and you just, mm-hmm. just play your game. And if you get beat, you get beat. If you win, you win. And, that's what happens. You play the game to win and have fun, and, you know, it just happens that if you knock someone out of tops just randomly, it's what happens. And, yeah. like yeah. you said, scooping impacts all the way down the chain because, like, mm-hmm. things happen, and then this guy doesn't get in, or this guy's tiebreaker gets worse, or or even with ID too, that that just throws a whole nother, like, wrench in the, in the works. Yep. Yeah. And strength of schedule yep. is really a messy subject as well, right? So, yeah. I mean, the thing is, too, is, like, I don't – I mean, personally, I hate diversity. Um, like, I, you know, came from a game where, like, especially in the early days, it would be, like, 50% of the field would be playing one deck. Um, decks would basically were basically, like, judged on their viability by whether or not they could beat one deck Mm -hmm. um you know if they could then it was like okay i my matchup against you know this deck is decent how how do i do against like these other couple decks that have showed up um you know do i have like positive ratios against them um and it was just kind of accepted um for this i feel like I, i think before that i guess that's the sort of the caveat is i think before um like bebop and mortal kombat I would have been more comfortable just getting rid of it entirely. Uh, I think that there were enough things that were viable and people in general just kind of are like, they don't necessarily want to just like net tech something or build the exact same thing that a bunch of other people are playing. You know, I think people like to, you know, sort of be on their own to sort of have like, Oh, well, you know, I had this character sort of to myself, like I've done these cool things with it. Like other people are sleeping on it. I'm going to like prove it. Um, and I think that, you know, the diversity rule in some ways is kind of a um, cover just honestly for the designers and for the players, you know, where they can say, 
Um, this character might be too good, but it's okay with the, like, you know, it's not going to win every event and it might not even top every event because people will play it less than they would otherwise. And for the players, it sort of works where it's like, you know, even something like a Liu Kang, a Quan Chi, um, they're like, man, this character is like way too good, but you know, probably won't see more than like four or five copies of it in an event. And, you know, if I see it in tops, I only have to beat it once. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And it also, you know, it also allows them to play decks that, you know, maybe aren't as good and still sort of have this like opportunity to make it into tops just because the field, you know, will be a little bit less crazy than it would be if everyone was playing what they perceived as like the best That's deck. Yeah. Um, that said, I think that the diversity like does have like a pretty you know, sort of like a long history with the game. I think that there are a lot of people that do like it. Um, you know, I, I hear commonly, you know, people like looking at magic or um, other card games where, you know, you'll have a top eight and it'll be like four or five copies of the same deck with maybe like a couple cards different. And then the other like, you know, four or five slots or three or four slots will be filled out with like, two other decks, you know, that kind of counter that and something else. And that gets old too. Um, you know, if you're just seeing top cuts and everything's the same, everything's like a little bit of a variation on the same character, the same archetype, um, you know, that, that also can be sort of a problem. I mean, that makes certain cards go up. That makes players just feel like they can't compete if they can't afford this sort of deck that everyone's playing right now. Um, and so there is, there's definitely value in some sort of system that encourages you to play other characters or to, or just sort of the field. I, I like to think of it as diversity is kind of like, what's well, in like in sort of an incentive systems, diversity is a stick, you know, it's not a carrot. Um, mm -hmm. it's sort of a threat where, okay, like you can play this character, but if you do, and someone else shows up, like, you need to be better than them. And if you're not, like, you're not going to top. Yeah. And <clears throat> I think that it works best sort of pre-tournament. I think diversity works best when people are basically scared off of even, like, showing up with something. For whether it's fear that other people are, like, you know, if it's something where I'm like, man, you know, I really want to play, like, you know, Felicia or something. But I know Garrett's going to be playing Felicia or, like, you know, Mark LeBlanc's going to be playing Felicia. Um, you know, I don't want to have to play everyone else and at the same time be, like, looking over my shoulder for these, like, accomplished players that are on the same thing. Maybe I'll play something else. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. what you do, the uh, sort of the flip side of that is when you start getting tournaments like this where you have 14 Liu Kangs, like 10 uh, Jackies, 8 Vicious once the tournament starts, that's, you know, that's, it's too late now. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we had, I believe it was like 36 unique characters or something like that 39. at nationals out of 99 players. Mm -hmm. And, you know, only 16 of those care, like 16 of those 36 can make it in the tops. And presuming that, you know, the like what 30 ish people that are on three characters like they're all good characters. Like some of those people are going to be at top tables late in the game, and there's going to be somebody who's better than them. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you get these situations where you have a bunch of people that there's two, three rounds left in the tournament, and <coughs> they don't have anything to play for anymore. You know? Yeah, um, and that's and that's if I could just interject. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a big fan of diversity, but I think it. it you said it works before the tournament starts. Mm -hmm. Most, and that's true. It's it's great in theory, but it has a lot of hiccups in practice, um, and a lot of that is because when it's practically playing, it's uh, playing out during a tournament. It gets to what we were talking about scoops. It gets to infighting, talking, matchups. It changes the the scope of a tournament. So, mm -hmm. if they're not going to get rid of diversity, which I don't think they would because of various reasons, they need to improve it practically in my opinion they need to look at this theoretically and say look it's doing what we want it to do before tournaments people are exploring different things more often having more fun with the character pool 
but practically it's leading to these types of experiences for older players and more importantly, the newer players, mm -hmm. right? So how do we make this even better? And I was talking to Shane and he's like, well, why do you think people are talking about it now? And we talked about how some of its character concentration, but I also think they've improved the tournaments as well. Like mm -hmm. we used to have timing issues with tournaments. We used to have deck list problems. We're now at the point where we're running on time. We got standards. It's time to look beyond the, the basic stuff and tackle the, the practical sure. bad parts of diversity and make them better is, mm -hmm. is my own opinion. Sure. Yeah. Sure. It's just a logical next step. Yeah. Now so, you, uh, I, I know talking to you, you had an idea about rounds, right? I have? just threw out some ideas. I didn't really think of them all the way through. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I come from a pretty big board game background. So I was thinking, well, what, there's a lot of games like that where, uh, you don't want the game to be over halfway through where there's like maybe a kingmaker or mm -hmm. the game's over. Everyone knows so-and-so's winning. We're just playing the last half of the game for no good reason. Sure. Right. Right. I mean, Maybe to drag them down or just to fuck around, right? I don't know. Excuse my yeah. my French. I don't worry about <laughs> it. The best rounds are kind of similar to that with diversity, where you you might be out halfway through, mm -hmm. um, and at that point, what are you going to do? And a lot of the board games, they they take this issue and they deal with it in two different ways. One, they might make it so that you don't know what your score is; it's hidden. Um, and another way they do it is they might make the game length variable. You don't know how quickly the game's going to end, or if there's going to be extra rounds. Maybe mm -hmm. you will have a chance to catch up. Right, so they kind of put the the carrot on the stick out there for you to not understand. In UFS, we we have results published, uh, posted. It's very easy to tell. Oh, if I win this match, I'm going to make top cuts, right. or if I tie here, if we both ID, we're both in. Right. So I'm not saying hide that information from players. That would cause even more trouble, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought maybe you might actually, you know, they talked about adding an extra round before. Maybe they do. Maybe they add an extra round. Maybe they make it random adding an extra round after the end of rounds. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily practical. That was just something I was throwing yeah. out there. It was, it was actually really, I, I liked it. It's a cool like idea. Said, I think logistically it's tough. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it'd be interesting oh, so like, for yeah. nationals. If, you know, we needed basically seven rounds, like based on the number of participants, mm -hmm. I think it would have been interesting if it was sort of like the base would be like, you know, for something like that would be like the extra round. So like eight, but then it could be seven, it could be nine, and you don't know what it is. Like, it could be, like, seven, eight, or nine rounds. Like, you don't know. And so you can't sort of make those, like, deals, if you will, because, like, you don't know. Like, you know, you could sit down, and it's just like, oh, it's the last round. And you're like, okay, well, <laughs> yeah, guess it's the last round. Like, yeah. didn't, yeah. all right. Yeah, so there, there are other things they can do, right? The most common one I hear is allow two characters in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of one, so kind of lessening up on diversity. Um, the other thing I hear is you can have a playoff between diversified people, but then you get even more arguments about fairness, like oh, I finished first, he finished second, now he's beating me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of it, you know, it's it's difficult. Um, the other thing you could do is you could structure the tournament differently to the point where you have um, kind of like a instead of a cut to top sixteen, you cut at top thirty two after a certain number of rounds. Mm -hmm. um, without diversity or something like that. Uh, Have those people play each other. Um, now they're all fresh, right? Yeah, so right. The, first, the first couple of matches are done. Um, they're no longer way behind this person that they were fighting diversity against. Mm -hmm. And now now they have more meaningful rounds for the last three or something like that's that. That's kind of, I feel like yeah. that's kind of what they do with a lot of the big tournament, like where they'll have like day two effectively. Didn't, mm -hmm. didn't Versus like, yeah. have something like that where it was like we had a certain amount of rounds and then it would break for day two and we'd have more rounds and then, then we'd yeah, have a top I mean, cut. There's, after there's that. a lot of stuff like that. And typically, I feel like it almost works like golf where, you know, you just play a certain number of rounds and you don't know exactly where the cut line is going to be. Um, mm hmm. And it ends up basically just determined on records where, mm -hmm. you know, they kind of figure it out and they're like, all right, we want to let about this many people through and, you know, we'll figure out what that record is when we get there. Sure. Um, but that's something, I mean, that's something they could absolutely do for like, you know, if we ever sort of get to the point where we're having like multiple, like hundreds of people at events, you know, where we're having like, Two, 250, 300, 500, something like that, then I'm like, sure. Tough. I mean, you almost have to. Yeah, yeah um, you do. Yeah. But, like, you know, right, for, you know, 80, 100, like, I don't know if that's, like, super feasible. 
Um, I, I do kind of like the, like the softening it up, maybe letting like, I, I've heard some people say maybe it's like one, it's still going to be one for like top eights, but for top 16s, you would extend it to like two. two. Um, you know, that's something where it won't completely fix stuff. I mean, there's still going to be someone who's like the third person, the fourth person, but, um, you know, it, anything where you're letting like extra people in or like at least giving them the opportunity. Like that's the thing is like, you might be like, well, for instance, for this tournament where Cody Kent was like six Oh going into round seven and you know, nobody else was like that close on like the Liu Kang matchup. But where was like the second Liu Kang, you know, there could have been a lot of people that were like, all right, well, you know, I'm not going to be able to catch number one, but I might be able to catch number two. Um, yeah. If you look at that practically, I was at table five against a Liu Kang, and I think table six had a Liu Kang, and table seven had a Liu Kang. Mm -hmm. You know, at that point, all three of those Liu Kangs play instead of all scooping mm -hmm. or whatever they did. <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, they played it out and then yeah. circled other names or whatever. Right? I mean, whatever they're doing, all of a sudden it adds more incentive. I think it makes mm -hmm. a great deal of difference. Obviously, mm -hmm. there'll still be some odds cases where you know who was number one and two. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then right. you have the same problem, but yeah. you, you just reduce the chances of that happening. Mm -hmm. and I think that also sort of helps for some, I feel like some of the worst cases that we've seen this year, which one, I mean, one of them was the Vegas PTC where one and two were both spike one. That was uh, mm -hmm. Tamron and Scott Sunman. Yeah. And they did get to play in the last round, but they drew, uh, they went yeah. to time. And so they were both like six Oh one. And it ended up just like being deterred. I mean, obviously that's top eight, so maybe this wouldn't apply to that. But that, that's the kind of thing, you know. And maybe so, maybe something else you could do would be like maybe for like the top half of top cuts, like you don't, you know. So if it's like for top four, maybe in a top eight, you would say like, okay, there's no diversity for top four. If you have like one of the four best records, you're in. Yeah. And then after, like, basically for five through eight, you just say, okay, diversity is in effect now. Like, you should have had one of the best. Records. Yeah. I mean, at what point can you not complain, right? Like, okay, yeah. you're, you're in the top 16 and you're second and you got booted out. That's a lot worse than being, yeah. Yeah. you know, second best in a 20th yeah. or something. And, yeah. I mean, so, <laughs> so, like, that would have happened. Uh, and then that's the thing is that at Worlds, um, I think it was a similar thing. It was uh, Scott again and I believe Corey. And I don't, I think Keenan was, um, no, <laughs> Scott Keenan was, was, no, was Scott was, there, but I think Corey was like second or third. And I think Scott was like Scott. one behind him. Yeah. And yeah. you know, that's sort of another situation where you like, and I don't think they played and it's just kind of one of those things where you end up like, you know, what, what more am I like supposed to, you know, it's like I had, you know, there's like a hundred some people in the room. I have like a top three, top four record. Um, you know, like. And, and especially with like scoops, IDs, whatever, like yeah. there's only so much, you know, you have a certain amount of control, but not like, a t you know, you don't, you don't have complete control over like what other people are like, other people's records if you don't play. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the at nationals here, we had the um, Jackie that was like six and one, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And he was in third place. I th uh, it was either third or fourth. I don't, um, I don't remember if Andrew Forrest was better or worse than him. And he got diversified as well because of uh, J Ray, and mm -hmm. like those those are the bad diversities. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where you know you have someone that's like eliminated and like you know technically yeah like someone else had a better record, but you know they have a better record than like ninety eight percent of the field or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, like you can't feel good about something like that. I don't yeah. think. Um, now, like how, like say, let's say they outlaw scooping. Could they do that? No, I, I don't think that works. I don't. I don't, I don't think, think it's practical, it, anyways. Because no. um, the thing is, is, I mean, because even if you're like, okay, you can't just give someone a win. Yeah. Okay, fine. I just won't play a tax. Yeah. Or like, like, okay, I'll play this one attack, or, and it'll be like mid yeah. or high, or they'll play something, and I won't block it. You know. Sure. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's no there's no practical way to outlaw like punting a match yeah, or that's true. like scooping or something like that. Like you just can't. Um, I think you have to. I, I, like that's the thing is, I don't think you can like be more heavy handed about like you have to play. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I think you can do things that make people want to. Um, 
it'd be nice if the diversity prizes, you know, like I, I wish that, you know, people that were sort of diversified kind of had this mentality of like being like, well, I'm not going to make tops. So I'm going to just try to keep other people out of top. you know, sort yeah. of like this gatekeeping like, like spoiler or whatever. Yeah. You know, like you, you'll see it, you see it, especially in like sports, you know, like there'll be somebody who's like, um, and I, you know, I watch like a lot of baseball and like the Orioles this year were terrible and they, they were terrible enough that they weren't really beating anybody. But in other years, you know, like you might be something where in the last like two weeks of the season, like you're mathematically eliminated, but you still have a say over who gets in. Yeah. You, know? yeah, you like, play the spoiler, you play the spoiler, yeah. right? Like yeah. you can sort of be like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to do what I can to make you miss tops as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. We don't have that as much in UFS because I, I, we're I think so close everything. and because we... Yeah. The immediate, I'm across from you, yeah. and like I said, you don't think about the ramifications of who you're hurting. You just you just think about who you're helping, and that's yeah. your opponent. And, and I think part of it too is like it's just you know it's just more friendly. You know, I don't yeah. think there's that much of like a rival. You know, you you'll get stuff like Chris was talking about where he's like has some people that he's like familiar with that he's never beaten and he yeah. wants to beat them. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot more you get people where you're like, ah, oh, I'm buddies with this guy. Like, mm-hmm. I'll help him. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I'd be interested in like a little bit of a better diversity prize. Something else that I've seen a lot, and this is more for IDs as opposed to scooping. Or, but it works for scooping too. If you're, you know, if you're just like, well, like I'm in, like I don't care if I'm in like fourth or like twelfth, it doesn't matter. Like, but I'll, you know, give this person a win so they get in. Is if you have seating. Mm-hmm. instead of a die roll for tops um and i like this a lot is i that, think yeah tim has suggested that to me um, uh, is that are you talking like how keenan's thing was where he was top mm-hmm. seeds so we got to go first in his entire top yeah. cuts yeah okay i, I like I, that you idea. know i think that it's i think you know theoretically instead of going first maybe it's like it gives you the choice in case you want to go second, second. I don't, yeah. you know well, there could, cons- yeah, yeah. It could, there could conceivably be a character that's like really good going second Jackie. um i think it's generally better to go first just yeah. because your opponent wants to go first yeah, but exactly yeah um but yeah i i think that you would see a lot of people that would just be like well i mean Maybe if it's like, okay, well, ID, because if one of us loses, we're going to be out, and I don't want to take that risk. But for the people where they're like, you know, people would care about being Swiss champ. Yeah. You know, if, if you're like, I don't care if I'm first or third, whatever, like, you'll care. Like, if that oh, yeah, you always get to go first for the rest of the top cuts. Yeah. That matters. Um, <laughs> that's in, in UFS, I mean, that's a whole other topic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Discussing I, I think, the I first think we versus need to second result. A bit. But if um, we. You know, that's a great idea in my opinion. I mean, we, the, with the, I know Tim and Jeremy were sort of talking about that. And I think <laughs> you would probably have to also like introduce that with a rule about um, like the mulligan. Um, I think that you need to slick, like going first is such an advantage. I think you need to give the person going second a little bit of a, you know, advantage yeah. as well in that case. Like it's a separate issue. I think they should right. do it anyways. Because yeah, I mean, I, I would love it. Um, mm-hmm. the difference between first and second has always been huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I don't know. I think that, um, <laughs> sort of like you said, there's, there's a lot of new players. I think that the game is growing a fair amount. Um, I, I was, I said this on the last show we were doing, there were way more people at Nats than I expected. Um, and a lot of new people too. A lot of people I'd never seen before. And I think that sort of this is an opportunity for them to take a look at some of the stuff that we kind of take for granted and say, okay, how can we make this better going forward? How can we, um, you know, make these tournaments like more competitive, um, have people sort of like excited to play, like even in like some of these like later rounds. Um, There are a lot of people I know like who made, who made tops and they talked about, you know, Oh, well, like I had two people scooped me at the end. I had, mm-hmm. you know, like, I mean, I, I talked to one person who I don't think played like a straight up round after lunch. <laughs> um, you know, they had some people scooped to them. They had, well, they, it like, was as early as that. Yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. <clears throat> and at that point, it's like, why, <laughs> why even play that? Just drop, you know, like if, you know, if you're not going to like come to this event to play UFS, like, yeah, just don't. <laughs> But I don't know. Um, That's the biggest problem for me personally as someone who's played forever and who has won lots. 
I play because I like the tight games and the crazy mm-hmm. good games. And every opportunity that goes away drives me nuts. And yeah. when it's gone in the seventh or sixth or, you know, last or second last round, it just feels like it sucks because that's a perfect chance for there to be an amazing game because mm-hmm. here's two players that both have really strong decks that have played well all day. And they probably would have an amazing game if they both had something to play for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But at, at this point, um, both of them are looking at each other. ID or I can't win anyways. Here's your, you know, yeah. whatever. Um, I'm either playing spoiler and you're going to hate me or I'm going to give it to you and you're going to love me, but I probably just hurt my friend below me. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's just a mess, yeah. right? Yeah. Players shouldn't have to go through that. Yeah. We can improve it to a point where they go through it a lot less is my opinion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I agree with that. And, that and play more amazing games yeah. with mm-hmm. top level, top level decks versus top level decks. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the thing is I don't think that there's really, you know, really anybody who like, making some of the top things that like doesn't deserve to be there. I mean, yeah, there's some very good games and tops. I mean, there's some not great ones, but you know, like I don't think anybody really gets that far where like their deck wasn't good. I mean, you still are going to have to win like three, four matches, yeah. like to even get to the opportunity to have people like scooping you in. But yeah, I want to um, be clear. I don't think any of this idea in your screen <laughs> impacts the overall results of a tournament. Like, yeah. I don't think anyone has won a tournament. Um, because someone has scooped to them multiple times, and then they went on to win all the top cut matches right. without without not working their ass off in those top yeah. cut matches. Right. Right. Like so, you know, while it impacts the integrity of results, it doesn't impact the ultimate integrity or the yeah. integrity of the ultimate result. Yeah, in my right. It's like once you're in tops, I mean, you know, you still have to win like to win. three or four games yeah. against like good decks. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just about improving those last couple rounds experience for me, which mm-hmm. I think is worth it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. That's okay, why, well, why don't we talk about yeah. some other things? I don't think anyone's going to tell you, you know, we shouldn't improve the tournament structure, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Except for the people that actually have to figure it out and do it, and maybe they don't want to work. That's yeah. the only people that should reject it. Because I hear yeah. from every play group under the sun, um, you know, I got in, so and so scooped to me, right? Like, mm-hmm. That just doesn't sound good. No, you know? it doesn't. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't sound good to anyone, no, right? It does not. I'd rather say I got in, I played this awesome match in mm-hmm. the seventh round, um, and I was pumped to be there, right? It's not like, it's totally different. It's night and day from what it could be. And, so. then, you, and then you come home and you just tell your co-host, man, I forgot the double cats, and then you just cry. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. were so close. I'm so close. So close. So close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, UFS is a hard game. Oh There's yes. A lot of things you it, can forget to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it doesn't help that you. If I, I was on uh, pain meds all weekend, so yeah. But that's that's an excuse that I should not use. And you know what? Well, it won't happen again. That's one thing I'll never forget <laughs> to do. Uh, so uh, we will move on. To, what was next on the on the on the list for our topics? Um, well, I wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, <clears throat> kind of like metagaming, sure. um, which I feel like dovetails a bit with what, you know, we talked about. I mean, there's less of a meta. Like, you know, I talked about games where it's like, well, you knew 50% of the field was this. Yeah. Um, I don't think, you know, obviously you don't have that, but you're still going to know the good decks where, mm-hmm. like, you know, you, you might have a deck and you're like, man, this is really good, but, man, I hope I don't play, like, Liu Kang. Or, <laughs> man, I hope I don't play, like, Vega. You know, or something Zoe. like that. And... Yeah. You can still win. Yeah. I mean, you know, we can we can uh, pull up some clip of uh, you know Tim Keefe just like yeah, I just dodged that way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just something. Yeah. Uh, you know that that's uh, that'll work. Yeah. But um, I think that there's a, there's a lot of decks now where they're so focused on kind of like their offense. You know, there there's a lot of sort of like race car decks just because attacks are so powerful. Um, like, there's a lot of just, like, really, really, like, high-value, early-game, just explosive offense. And I don't think that you see as many people... Like, you do. I mean, <clears throat> a lot of the Jackies, like, the Cassies, um, stuff like that are more um, sort of defensive-oriented. I mean, Vega, something like that. Mm-hmm. And they are a little bit more equipped to sort of, like, survive that early onslaught and, like, leverage that a bit. Um, but I mean, there's lots of other characters, you know, other than these like four or five. Um, and I think that players don't always know like how, like kind of like what balance they should strike or what cards Mm -hmm. they should be looking at. Um, I I know like there've been some times for Chris's like locals where he's just like, 
stomping them with some deck. Like, what was it? It was Padley, right? It was Grant like, Padley with everywhere. Body to yeah. for like a month. Yeah. Well, Grant Padley is pretty good, though. Yes. Yeah, and and really I was just like, oh, he still is good. It's yes. just, you know, you know, it's like, for something like that, for like a locals, it's like, that's a little easier, right? You can know, like, man, I get beat up by this deck every week. Like, yep. I'm sick of it. Yep. Um, and I guess, like, just <clears throat> um, how you go about that. And I know, like, you know, Garrett, like, you always sort of have these decks where, you know, you have all these, like, crazy numbers, like, a big deck. You got, like, all these little, like, kind of tech answers. And um, <clears throat> I figured you might be a good person to sort of talk about that, about how you go about, um, <clears throat> like, it's like assessing mm. uh, sort of a meta, like, what kind of cards you want to include, why, like, you know, kind yeah. of what you <laughs> think about when you deck build. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the the biggest problem I've had with deck building the last two tournaments, um, the Bebop meta and now the Bebop MK meta, essentially. Um, I had, I have never struggled as much as I've struggled these last two events trying to build a deck from a number standpoint, simply because I'm the type of player that likes to come into a game kind of like Jeremy Ray. Jeremy Ray tackles this by playing large, large vitality characters because he doesn't like to lose on turn two. Mm-hmm. Whereas I tackle this by paying, playing decks that have answers tech-wise to mm-hmm. everything that I think could kill me. Mm-hmm. Right? I like to play the game. I like to have the experience of making the right decision or the wrong decision in the game. Yeah. Right. Uh, so in order to get there, I have to make all the right decisions while building the decks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was an, it was almost impossible to do it in the Bebop meta. Um, I think I almost got there, and then I misplayed the hell out of my deck. But <laughs> And this meta with Liu Kang and formerly Quan Chi, which both impose really the same barrier, um, it's very, very difficult to do, mm-hmm. except for the fact they do have those explosive attacks that you were talking about, Chris. Mm-hmm. That's the only saving grace of it, because, and I heard it on your uh, UFSU collaboration when Barrett was explaining it, you have to kill Liu Kang after he misses killing yeah. you. Yeah. Um, because if you don't, he will just reload his gun. Mm-hmm. Um, he takes, he makes the game so easy because he reloads his gun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, High level UFS used to be about crafting a hand, yep. holding on to attacks and not blocking with them, and playing review steps and all this stuff perfectly. Liu Kang made it so that you could just have one attack and all of a sudden have eight. Yes. So you have to kill him on the backswing. Liu, uh, Quan Chi was the same way. You didn't have to kill him on the backswing, but you had to kill him with one giant attack or a few giant attacks mm-hmm. or enhances. Because if you were going to kill him by death by a thousand cuts, he would just regain all the life, or he would those thousand cuts wouldn't be cuts. They'd, yeah. <laughs> they'd, just, yeah. they'd be zero damage attacks, right? Yeah. So um, that that was the meta heading into this event. And that is the meta a lot of the times. Um, how quickly can you kill or how quickly do you need to kill versus mm-hmm. how well do you have to be able to kill something or dismantle a wall later in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes those things are the same. Sometimes you can have the same offense that can kill really fast or dismantle something really well laid on. And sometimes they're completely different things. And when they're completely different things, you really need to decide which one you're going to go for and why. Mm-hmm. All I heard was deep freeze frost hammer in that comment. <laughs> That's all I heard. Cause those, yeah, two, well, like those two cards do that. They can kill people mm-hmm. on turn two. And with deep freeze, you're able to break through a wall. Cause last night I played against a Johnny cage deck and he, and he put up three show conferences on me and I was like, yeah. Deep freeze, seal those, and then I just went to town. So yeah, yeah, I know exactly there's a very good reason about. why I chose to play Spike One, and yeah. that's because I landed on that attack lineup being the one that I could kill turn two. Yep. Uh, with um, swimming birds can do it, deep oh, freezes yeah. can do it, especially if they can't block and they've got three things stunned, whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a good example of an attack lineup in mm-hmm. this meta that yep. worked. But there's always been ones before. Oh yeah, sure. Um, when I was playing Navas and things like that, people look at Navas and say, "Well, Gary, you're just playing that." Because you want to wall up and kill him in one shot. Well, no, I want to play it because if you if you try to kill me and you fail, I have this desperation three attack that's probably going to kill you if I can make it hit. Oh, sure. So you notice I always played it with speed pumps because yep. it actually gave me that that double that double edged sword. Mm-hmm. If you just right. play it and play it only for the long game, you're not nearly getting as much out of it as sure. if you play it and make it a threat early and late. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So your, your meta question is really important because in UFS, unlike other games like Magic, with diversity in effect, you usually have to build to accommodate for a lot more different things that could kill you. Mm-hmm. And you have to build your deck with a lot of different pieces 
that you can adapt to on the fly. Uh, and we only get an eight card sideboard, which also makes it relatively <laughs> intriguing. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I think U of S can handle diversity because we have a 60 card deck, which is bigger than a lot of things. And the option to go from one to four and the option to go over 60 cards. Mm -hmm. So I think like diversity actually makes sense for UFS theoretically. The only time it's failing in my mind is the practical tournament execution of it. Sure. Right. Um, we also have 12 symbols and like lots of different diversity in what's viable, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For the most part, like UFS is just this kind of like garbage can or pizza of stuff. Like you can throw anything on it and make it work, right? Yeah. Some people will like the pineapple. Some people will like the jalapenos. Yeah. You get some idiot who just has nothing on it and eats a plane, right? I don't know. Right? <laughs> Teach their own, right? That's, that's, the, that's the beauty of UFS. Yeah. There's no, there's no right or wrong. There's yeah. uh, right or wrong for you. Correct. Mm -hmm. right? Yep. And I think that's like the one of the coolest things about our game is that you may build a deck, I may build a deck with the same symbol, and they could be completely different. And yours wins tournaments, mine wins games, and it's just you know it's like it's just the way people execute in the long run. Yep. And that I think that goes yeah, down to what you're saying about meta choices. And I may not see that like with the local groups how we're you know we don't have a lot of. I, I guess like a lot of tournaments in a month, we usually have one PTC or nationals and we don't, we have like a meta, but we don't have like a real, like a magic style. This is always happening. This is, this is what we have to tackle because we're more, just more regional metas than we are like an yeah. overall meta. It's a lot more free floating and it, it really, it really makes you want to deck build. Mm -hmm. Like UFS, half of my fun in the game. I love playing it. Don't get me wrong, but deck building is so much fun in this game because of, the question marks yep. up in your head. Right? Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and to get back to your point about the meta, I built Spike One to be able to beat Liu Kang mm -hmm. consistently, have a chance against Quan Chi with giant enhances, uh, Frost Hammer and Swimming Bird, mm -hmm. and beat Cassie Cage because she, I thought she was going to win the event. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, there note, it is. I, I, I was wondering get, when that was going to happen. Wish. I didn't actually get to play a single Cassie all weekend oh, with my speed reduction deck. Yeah. Here I build a deck that can beat Cassie because I think she's the biggest threat, and I don't even get to play her. See, I did a, get seven Liu Kangs, but... That's, know, see, that's another thing about our game, too, is that you could tech your deck for something. Like, I built my Liu Kang to fight other Liu Kangs, and I never faced Liu Kang all day. I got stomped on by, like, Jackie and Vega and, and Jet, and I never faced a Liu Kang at all, and that was... And teams I did, but in singles, that's what I was gunning for was just to yeah. fight the diversity, and I'd never even seen one. Yeah, and so that's why when I'm building a deck and you come back to what you ask me, what do you do? I, I try to rank cards as three different categories. A card that's good against everything. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be happy to see this in any matchup. Mm -hmm. Usually offensive cards uh, meet that criteria because i have to kill anyone right so a damage pump card or whatever might be a great card in every matchup right mm -hmm. um but even better than that is a card that's both defensive and offensive because then i can decide in that matchup do i want to exhaust or commit this card in a defensive capacity or do i want to play this in an offensive capacity so you have these cards that are good in almost every matchup and usually they're offensive cards or cards that are both offensive and defensive mm -hmm. Then I have these cards that are just really, really good against certain things. Like, let's say, chasing the fight money um, against Liu Kang or something like that to get right. rid of Yin and Yang. Mm -hmm. And you, you look at that card and you go, well, should I play four of this or should I play three of this? Or should I play two of this? Because I'm not going to fight any Liu Kangs the second I put this in my deck. That's just, yeah. you know, that's Morgan's Law, right? But <laughs> yeah. um, you have to start making risk analysis and, and make all those decisions. Um but in, in this case, Liu Kang was such a threat that you did have to. Mm -hmm. Because you still have to play a deck, get it to a point where you can win against something else 50% of the time, or else why even play the game? Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So even though it's not an ideal card, I ended up having to play it at four times. So yeah. that's just the way it is. So yeah, there's that category of cards, things that are good against everything, cards that are bullets that are good against some things. And then you have to analyze, you know, run the risk of what's the chances I'm actually going to see that. I mean, and I guess if I can interject, one of the nice things too is so like that thing is you talk about like fight money and how it's like okay, this is sort of like anti Liu Kang tech. Um, <clears throat> I feel like one of the advantages though of having the um, of using Spike is that 
every foundation that you put in your deck also has like mm-hmm. sort of the ability of you can flip it for like plus two or minus two speed. Yeah. So like mm-hmm. you can have this card where you're like, okay, it's like a one diff, um, but it's also like a plus two low block, which generally isn't bad. That's usually like the weakest zone. Um, and so that's the thing is even in, in uh, like spike, like you can have a foundation where you're like, well, this doesn't really help me in my matchup. So that's okay because I need <laughs> sort of like these chaff foundations that I'm going to burn for yeah. like my speed mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. So. And then spike, spike also, helped in, in that respect right um at least it gives me the peace of mind that yeah i could just flip it whatever mm-hmm. so any spam foundation is actually pretty good in spike because it didn't cost me a lot to get it out Fair. and i actually needed to pay other costs um, but i'm a very greedy player so every mm-hmm. single card i assume i'm not going to flip it if yeah. i don't have to no, fair. Like, right. I, True. you if you watch me play spike you probably noticed i have nothing face down until close to the end of the game when i'm killing someone yeah. or if they're pressuring me a yeah. lot, a lot, a lot. Yeah. I'll be right. flipping things face down to survive, sure. um, which is probably a lot different than some people play Spike. Yeah. Um, I've seen Spike one played totally different ways by totally different people. Mm-hmm. Some are very aggressive with them and see plus two speed for a low cost and plus one damage is a pretty good offensive gambit. Um, and I've seen people who just hide on, sit on them like me and don't flip them if I don't have to. Mm-hmm. And then I've seen some people who don't, don't seem to have a rhyme or reason to what they're doing. Um, they almost do it on a case by case basis where they're like, this will help me block without committing. So I'm going to flip it. Yeah. And they don't seem to be thinking about the long term, but at the same time, they're just kind of making judgment calls from, from bit to bit, which Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, all three strategies are probably viable depending on what you're doing. Right. Yeah. So the medic call was, was Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. But more importantly, Cassie. Yeah. There's number two. Oh, yeah. I was waiting. I was waiting. I have a timer. I was like, oh, man, we're so far into the show. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I guess in that sort of vein, mm-hmm. um, I know that you sort of said that you thought one of the reasons that Cassie was very well positioned is because she was one of the only decks, I would say, that could pump speed to such a great amount. Um And, like, a lot of the other decks, I mean, Jackie kind of just overwhelms you with, like, do you have the right block zones? Because every single attack that I'm going to throw is, like, you know, double-digit damage. Um, Scorpion's kind of the same way, you know, putting, like, like both of them can just, like, put plus six or more on stuff, like, at the Mm -hmm. drop of a hat. Uh, Liu Kang is more, like, it's sort of pseudo-speed, I guess we would say, but it's, like, clogging your pool. So none of his stuff is really inherently fast. It's just that it's difficult to block because your card pool's messed up. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a, and it's a lot of attacks. Um, you know, somebody like Kotal is, you know, he'll make stuff like throws. So it'll just do like half damage and it'll be big. Um, someone like Vega, I mean, Vega is another one, like he has tiny speed pumps, but it's more about playing like long strings. So I guess they were like, right. I guess this meta was more about chain blocking or, more to the degree of chain block as much as you can and mm. then have a backswing. Yeah. Um, this meta was about blocking at all mm-hmm. and having a backswing. Yeah. yeah. Like when I say at all, I mean if you can block the key ones against Liu Kang, you will survive. Yeah. Right. If you can if you can block Cassie at all, you at least force her to do something else. Mm-hmm. But I mean the reason Cassie is so good is 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 because she doesn't get locked into a pattern. Um, she has enough draw that she can do whatever she feels is right at the time of the game. Like a Kimbo is the ultimate utility card in that respect mm-hmm. based on, based on her, her way of uh, going and all is also a really strong symbol um, with respect to the meta right now with characters being really strong. It has a lot of ways to answer characters yeah. mm-hmm. starting with things that people don't even play like saw blades and going to be but blues and so, uh, you can, you can off symbol, you can off symbol stop and stuff. Now, like now Garrett, I got it. While we're talking about saw blades, why, why, why don't you recommend uh, saw blades for that? Liu Kang deck that was in the UK. But I feel like you really let that guy down. <laughs> well, um, I wanted Mike Hardiman to win, so I didn't. But, uh, <laughs> if you're being if you're being serious, um, that deck, um, I didn't want to add too much tech into it mm, for gotcha. obvious reasons. And also, um, it was a deck playing uh, the action card stuff. So there's a lot of action, so. yeah. So there's yeah. a lot of deck dedicated to just. I want to build three on turn one or else I'm going to lose because if I only build two, I lose. Yeah. Uh, he's a six hander. There are, there were, there were dead draws with that deck. Mm-hmm. Um, 
there were a lot more times you don't dead draw and you just absolutely run people over. Yeah. But adding assets increased the dead draw percentages. Sure. And, you know. Sure. I didn't want to scare him with green cards. There's already blue cards in yeah. the deck, essentially. Very, very true. Very true. Uh, you, you've met Scott. Scott hates green cards. He's yeah. like, all the all I see is a card that is going to sit in my staging area and not pass checks. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep. Scott, I, I mean, he's a thousand percent right. I mean, you have to have a really good reason to run a green card. Sure. Yeah. Especially um, nowadays, because really, I was I was chatting with some people about assets lately, and it seems like Swordfish Two is really the only asset printed in like the last couple sets that people actually play. Yeah. yeah. Like, there's there's there a weird some dichotomy. Pits, and, yeah. You know, go ahead. Uh, let me, let me get, let you finish, and then I'll get you to my thoughts. Okay, but yeah. why don't why don't you finish why you think assets are um, not being played much right now? I just think that they're kind of like they're not game breaking. Like the old assets, are like you know, like the champ assets, like UFS House nailed it. You know, uh, napkin, like those were powerful, <laughs> and those things yeah. changed games. And now it seems like. You know, we had like Felicity Houses. It's decent. It's a good one. It's a you know, in certain decks, it's a it's a very good card. Like Saw Blades is good, but they they come with like a heavy cost. And if you play them at the wrong time, it they just kind of just mm-hmm. don't help you. Yeah, and and my thoughts on the asset issue right now is, um, and I say it, it's it's an issue, but Jason wishes there wasn't assets in the game, so maybe it's not an issue, but. Um, the issue is you have to be able to survive turn one and two a lot easier, a lot more, mm-hmm. and you also have to be able to backswing a lot more. Yep. So you you need, earlier too, right? Mm-hmm. It's less of a I construct my beast. You construct your beast. Let's have them battle. Yeah. It's a they're out the gates. You just mm-hmm. let the bulls run out in the gates and see what the hell happens. Mm-hmm. There's no construction. It's just like I'm gonna draw these cards and play these cards. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna you know I don't need this out and this out first. It's just sure. gonna happen. Yep. Right. You know, you've heard, you could hear Scott saying, oh, I won without yin and yang. Well, of course you did, right? Like, I mean, you just play what you draw at this point. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to play an asset, you better damn well be building three other foundations plus that asset turn one. Yeah. So you need to, yeah, you need to be a high hand size for Mm -hmm. one um, or else your draws are going to be bad. Yep. Or two, you would better have a really good defensive matrix that buys you enough turns to to utilize the asset. Mm -hmm. And you'll see in my spike one, I ran... Uh, I can't remember if I ended up going three assets main or two because that's the thing that changed my deck the most from time to time. But I ended up, I think I ended up with two. And the one asset was the one, both the UK assets, but oh. one was after you commit one of your opponents. Oh, yeah. Uh, that card's great. That card is so good. You commit one of their other ones. Yeah. And Defenders of the Empire. Obviously, uh, yeah. And obviously, it's really important in a deep freeze deck mm-hmm. uh, because it gives me an extra committal on offense. But defensively, I was also running other things. And the only reason that's a main board card in the meta that we were playing, or at least in my deck, was because I was also playing uh, cards like Ice Clone and things like Trusted Keeper where I could commit them on their turn. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, I could get rid of two Champion of Combats or whatever Mm -hmm. and commit down two plus X plus Xs. So I could use them them very defensively. Um, I could hit Shadow Inheritances. I could do things like that that are really necessary. Key foundation pieces. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. That's it. Yeah, so that that's, asset made it worthwhile. That that's asset really, really worthwhile. Rob loves I mean, that I, I, I've played Defenders in yeah. like one or two decks, and I mean, I I think I'd run it in almost any spike deck that was on like life or water. Or as long as I had, I mean, water, I guess like you said there, you have a little more defensive um, committal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess like life probably doesn't. Um, but yeah, I mean, just... <clears throat> Anything where you basically turn like a stun one attack into stun one and also target tap like your best thing, like mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, and then you can and then you can use it on offense and target tap something else. Yeah, right, right. right. Um, life does have one card that's really really good at that. That's the one that you ready at discard a momentum. One of Morgan's cards. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Right. Uh, uh, power split. That, right. Uh, power split. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't get targeted committal with the first one, but yeah. It's right. an easy I commit on your turn card as yeah. long as you're attacking and gaining momentum. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. you could also use it with that. Yeah. Um, so you, the other I, asset was Drag to Victory, I take it? Yeah, it was Drag to Victory. And that wasn't in a lot of my early builds, but mm-hmm. it came into my later builds um, largely because I stopped off Symboling Spiders because it was getting too clunky. Um, and I needed more control over key foundations the longer the game sure. went. So I needed to be able to flip one. And the other benefit of that card was 
I was also running a suite of uh, poolside dates where you can gain it if it's at the top. Okay. So I wanted to I wanted to mill some things. I wanted to change the top card of my deck. I was running one or two honky tonks as well. So I just it was just techie tricks. Mm-hmm. But the main thing that that asset did for me and why it ended up making the final build was because I could add it to the top of my deck and check a six. Yeah. And I'm playing Deep Freeze Frost Hammer. And those frost hammers are often played at the end of the string. Yeah. And I'm not a big fan of passing five diffs at the end of the string. I, I see them as the lead up attacks. Mm-hmm. But that was a final attack, um, right. five diff. Yeah. And so having a six really helped the math. Yeah. And made mm-hmm. sure I could I could go all in and know I can still pass it because I have. And, to it, pass and it, it stacks as a form too, right? So it's yeah, like, it's a, yeah, it's a form. Discard a momentum. That's a fairly high cost. But I was also running Fatality to fuel the deep freeze, and if I ever got two, I'd have that as a form as well, yeah, or sure. if the game was really late. Sure. So that's the main reasons I put it in there, and it, it served its purpose all the time. It didn't. It didn't. Two assets in an eighty plus card deck was fine. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's how bad the numbers are right now. Like if it was a sixty card deck, you'd have one asset yeah. at most because mm-hmm. of the speed of the meta. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think part of it too. Like, I think the other thing is like you said for that Liu Kang deck. I think. Some of it as well is like how good the action cards have been in the past couple sets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, orange um, card, blue card. You can win early yeah. if the orange cards and blue cards are amazing. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think like actions and assets typically fight over the same slots. Um, yep. You know, if the action's good enough, I feel like it can start to even bleed into like your attack slots. Um, you know, you'll see that with the uh, with like the punch and Judy's. Um, I with mean. Moon. You know, yep. I guess back in the day, like you could probably run um what was it, Heavenly Match that would like form to like pick up like yep. a low diff. Turns into um, an attack. Yeah. Right. Yep. You know, or I guess uh what was your card? Uh, when the moon, moon comes right? over the mountain. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I think yep. uh I think moon is, moon is a perfect example yeah. of a, oh, yeah. one yeah. that bleeds yeah. into yeah. your attack. Mm-hmm. The numbers. <laughs> always ran always ran four less attacks because I was running four <laughs> moons, so there was no point I mean, to play I more attacks. Fatality is an action card yeah. that bleeds into your Basically, attack. Basically, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that definitely cuts into your attack count. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, you've seen. I mean, especially with the punch and Judy stuff. I mean, you see so many decks that are you know up around like ten, eleven, twelve actions, and like you wouldn't have seen anything like that. I don't think about like a year ago, year and a half. Um, yeah. the most you might see is like stuff that was running like a bunch of Templars or Revokes. But even then, it's like if you're running four of both of those, it's like first of all, you're probably a seven hander, yes. and like. You know, yeah. Well, if it was a yeah. year and a half ago, you're probably an eight hander, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> you're probably an eight hander with no. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man of action. Actions are my favorite card in UFS. Sure. So, I've always run at least like six in any deck I play, and the main reason why is because I win games on tricks. Mm-hmm. Right. It's very hard to win going second in UFS. One of the best way to win going second is to trick your opponent. Mm-hmm. And cards that have effects from hand that are hidden are is the best way to trick them. Sure. Yeah. So. Action cards were the number one, but attacks are getting there right now because there's so many attacks that have defensive and static applications and crazy things like that. Mm-hmm. Whether you're talking hand cannon, show Woken, leaf shields, all these uh, things, even like big cyclone, yeah. yeah, yeah, like these are essentially split action cards, um, which is funny because they said they wanted to simplify the game and then they went and made these attacks dual purpose, <laughs> also one of the things added deadlock and extra abilities that have. Are, on sometimes and off other times. Yeah. And it's just a uh, the game is going going in a good direction in my opinion, but it's yeah. it's just funny that it kind of took them a while to figure out what the good direction was. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I gotta say, I, that's something I do. Um, I guess even like looking at some of the new stuff. I mean, there's definitely some big speed characters. So um, mm-hmm. Cassie might have some uh, competition, competition coming up. Yeah. yeah. There's, those dust in the winds, they're probably coming back. Like, uh, yeah. the balanced fighters. Like, I think some people are like, ah, you know, I don't need to run, like, four of this. Like, they'll probably be running four, four of that right? again. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, oh, like, yeah. The, like, the Morgans, the Gills. Like, uh, there's going to be yeah. some fast attacks. Chun-Li. Chun-Li has speed on her, too. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Man, Chun-Li with her, like, five diff, you know? Like, that's, that's a poke for you. Oh, I'll just, uh... Commit this like face down. Give yeah. You know, what is it? It's like eight or nine speed for like six. Yeah. And then you just build the face down as momentum, and then pitch momentum to get two more face downs. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of tricky stuff coming up, and yeah, a lot of that uh, stuff from that new set revolves around speed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And control hack. 
Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm uh, very excited for Raptor, to be honest with you, because finally we get a good Flash character. Yes. Everyone is talking to me about that, and I think Raptor is busted as hell. <laughs> I Plus, agree I lose the Quick Man all the time, so I'm scared of shit. So this guy. <laughs> you're, you're just like really worried that Tanner is going to pick him up. Oh, he's definitely going to pick him up. And even if he doesn't pick him up, he'll just take the good flash attacks and put him in Quick Man quick and mice me forever. <laughs> like, I don't think you understand. This, his Quick Man deck, one, one game that played nine foundations on me turn one. Nine foundations. Yeah, it's running Avarice, so it's drawing, and it's also running the thing that it's running like uh, the thing that uh, what Felicia's zero diff that goes down, you oh, commit a card, sure. and then it's running that other card that if you check it, you ready a card. Like the other one five, oh. it's got all these these stupid air spams, and when it goes off, it's just it's it's, it's disgusting. <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> um, who was it? The uh, I, I was thinking like. <laughs> Like the, the only thing for Quick Man, like, cause we we had someone who played him early on, and it was um, I think it was not on air. I think it was actually on Chaos. Um, cause I think it was Kyo, like the old one from um, oh the pro, I guess Ruler of Time. Um, <laughs> he had a couple things that were like responses that could sort of synergize yep. with flash yep, attacks. Sure. Sure. Uh, I think it was like pyrokinesis or something, right? That like did damage. Mm-hmm. Um. And he, he would sort of, like, mix it in. He had um, most of, like, the flash attacks, but he also had a couple, like, non-flash things that messed with your foundations. Like, I think he ran, like, Hyper Bomb and some other stuff. Mm-hmm. And it was a pretty interesting deck where, you know, it just put, like, some kind of weird pressure on you, like, foundational, like foundation-wise. And, yeah, I mean, plus two speed to all your attacks, like, isn't bad. Um, I, yeah, yeah. The it's not the speed, it's that him. they're losing foundations when he right. hits you. Yeah. Right? The, one yeah, of the so biggest issues it. I found with him was that the, because he doesn't have, like, it's not like you have to bounce ready stuff. It's not like you have to bounce, like, face-up stuff. Um, you know, it's, it typically sort of is like, oh, well, you know, the flash attack lineup isn't that varied. I mean, it's mm-hmm. more varied now. Yeah, so they'll but, just, you know, sort of just say, like, yeah. I'll just pick up whatever block zone I don't have. And especially now, I mean, there's, you know, there's foundations that have, like, plus one plus zero blocks so oh yeah you can sort of be shooting yourself in the foot and you're like yeah pick something up and like thank you <laughs> definitely yeah i mean and it comes back to quick man was always amazing going first but going mm. second he's not so good because sure. if you're going against someone who went first and they built four quick man's almost blank at that point except for his r yeah. like you're not gonna build your turn and then have a turn two against their turn two and a half where they've drawn and played out what they want to play out, right? Mm-hmm. Then they got seven foundations and four blocks in their hand if they're a seven-hander or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it comes back to the whole first versus second thing. Is It would be nice to see them do something about that because certain characters would play a lot more fairly and be more viable as well if mm-hmm. they got rid of that dichotomy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Now i got a question for you. We have a lot of newer players who watch the show. Um, what kind of... Uh, advice would you give to a new player like going into deck building for a tournament and tournament structure if you because you're a very you're you're one of the greats you're a veteran you have multiple pieces of cardboard um you're a fantastic board game player i may add and um <laughs> so i so I just want you know pick your mind a bit just about what do you what kind of advice you give to a newer player who's looking to become that from a local player to a travel player what kind of advice would you give? Um, when it comes to UFS, I think the biggest ad- or the best advice you can give someone new is just to um, try something different. Okay, a lot of people get into UFS and they get in because they have a favorite character. And they're like, oh, my favorite character is in this game. And they ram their head into the wall forever and ever and ever and try to build their favorite character. Mm-hmm. And eventually they might even make it work. Yeah. But they've hamstrung themselves a lot, right? And I did that too when I first started. I mean, I liked Vega, and actually I stopped doing that the very next day. I saw Wetzel and I liked his effects. So I'm like, I don't even know what this guy is. I'm going to play him. So maybe be like me, right? Find some mechanics you like. Don't just find characters you like. Sure. And even after you find them, play different things. Don't just play one symbol. The only way you're going to beat someone in a tournament on the fly is if you know what their deck does and have a really good understanding of it. Um, and have thought about it before getting there, right? Mm-hmm. There's nothing worse than get, sitting down across the table from someone and going, I didn't think about this in my preparation, yeah. and I'm doomed right now, mm-hmm. right? Because I haven't thought about it. I've just been thinking about my own deck 
and trying to do what I want to do. And by the way, I also have only played this deck for the last four months. I don't play everyone's deck. Yeah. Um, a lot of things what I do is when I play UFS locally, I'll play a game. I'll either destroy my opponent or get destroyed by them. And then I'll be like, here, give me your deck. And I'll play their deck. Mm-hmm. And they can take my deck or vice versa. Right? Um, it's, it's especially helpful if you just destroyed someone. And they're yeah. like, oh, my deck sucks and I can't do anything with it. You take their deck, you beat them with their own deck. And they're like, oh, yeah, maybe it was me who sucked. But, you know, at that point, they're a lot more willing to listen to your constructive sure. advice because you just have the deck in your hands. Yeah. You know what its weaknesses are even more now because you just drew that shitty hand of, like, why the hell are they running this attack lineup? You know, like, <laughs> no wonder this guy didn't beat me, right? Like, it, yeah. it's yeah. it's very important to play in your opponent's shoes. Mm-hmm. And it starts at the base level of building a deck. You think about your opponents while building a deck, and you think about them while you're playing it. And as a new player, think about them after you've played them. Sure. Right, and say, well, why did you do this? What would I have done if I had your deck in my hands? Mm-hmm. Why am I not playing your deck? And why am I not playing things that can beat your deck? And just have them ask questions, too. I guess yeah. UFS is a game of questions. Sure. Like most games are a game of questions. It's, you know, any, any game with decisions is a game of questions where you're going, well, why should I do this? Why shouldn't I do this? Why should I do this? And it's just, it's a lot of effort for some people who are new, but the sooner you ease them into the idea that, the more they think and the more they make their own decisions, mm-hmm. the better they're going to do in the long run. Sure. Thanks. That, that That's going to help out because we I went to a tournament and it was mostly, it was like a bunch of new people. There was a couple veterans and they were, they were, they were asking questions. They were they, like, they'd never seen some cards and there was a lot of reading of cards across tables. So that's usually a good sign is when, you know, someone's invested in UFS yeah. because they pull your cards that's... and they're like, what is this? You know, and they want to know. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. You got anything else for him, Rob? You got anything else? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, Cause no. Rob, I want to know why you thought Cassie was bad. Yes, there we go. There we go. <laughs> <sighs> I just want to get in your head for a second. Yeah, I mean, to me, like, let's see. Well, to be fair, when she yeah. first came out, when she first came out, we were because you know we went over the characters, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of back my partner up a bit on this one. Okay. Um, you know, with no support, face value, like she seemed okay, like not great, but she you know she had a cool dig and stack, which was nice, and then like the ore on the damage and speed pump was kind of like why isn't it both? We kind of know now why it is it's not both because <laughs> she'd be busted with both. But as her support came out, and then I I know that we agreed on this, Rob, where it was like, well, if you really are just going to play all of her... Like, we talked to Barrett on the last show, and she's really one of the only characters in MK that's like, you run her shit. Like, you you, very, you don't vary off of her page very much with like, her attack lineup. Like, he had, what, uh, Kersplat in his deck, so that was, like, the only non-Cassie attack, but, like, he ran other foundations, but you really need her core kind of to make her go is what Garrett, uh, not Garrett, what Barrett was saying, that you kind of need that core of her cards to push you to that next level, and so, but... I mean, I, you know. I guess, like, that's the thing. My my sort of take, if you will, is that she has, like, really good cards. I mean, I think that Shadow Inheritance is probably one of the better foundations in the whole set Mm -hmm. and she runs it well for sure i mean it has like a cassie as well that she gets like extra stuff out of it um and you know she plays offense in a way that enables the r to be used offensively instead of just defensively but i don't know like she doesn't strike me as like very powerful on her own like in a vacuum she just sort of seems like um, I don't know. Her offense requires you to go through a lot of hoops, if that makes sense. Um, it's not kind of just, you know, she she doesn't. It, it seems to me she doesn't take standard attacks and like makes them good. She sort of says, if you play in this certain manner, I can like enhance stuff. I mean, her attacks sort of supplement it by also wanting you to play in that manner. Um, but I think if like, if she was like a, like a tins character or something, if she didn't have like the glow kicks and the akimbos and whatever, like, I don't think she would be very good. 
Okay. I was talking, still think she's not very good herself. So I was, it's uh, just it's just her support yeah. that really pushes her over the edge. Otherwise, she's not even near the edge. Essentially, is what you're saying. <laughs> like I was talking. To I mean, Shrek. I don't know. Oh, I, go ahead. People, I, it seems like people really like her dig, which I guess I don't know. I've, I've, you know, I feel like every time I do a dig, and I'm just like, oh, here's like some attacks and actions. Great. I'm going through a like card in my card pool, but yeah. uh, I, was I don't talking, know. I mean, I've. Huh? I was talking with Trent last night on the way out to Chicago, and we, like, she's just solid. She's not flashy. She's not dull. She's just, like, she's a solid UFS character. Like, she does some really cool stuff, and, you know, I, I just, we, I've come to the light as of late. Not, you know, I've, as Cassie's been, I can't, I, that's who I wanted to play out of the set first was Cassie. And I trained for her cards, and then I just couldn't get her to work, so I just, and I was like, well, like Garrett said, Liu Kang's easy. Liu Kang was busted. So I'm just like, well, I'll just move on to that and work on Cassie as I'm playing this other deck. Cassie's not a beginner's character. No, she is not. No. Especially not from a deck building perspective. No, I mean, I guess, like, why don't you tell me why you think Cassie is really good and see if you can, like, convince me. <laughs> okay, well, not even talking about her support. The main okay. reason she's really good is that both of her abilities are not only free, um, I guess the first one is just free, but the second one is actually a negative cost in some cases because there's a lot of cards that you want to leave your staging area and be in your card pool. So there's a lot of cards that are good in card pools, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of cards that are good when things leave your card pool and stuff like that, or leave your staging area and stuff like that. Um, so her second E is kind of like this Swiss Army knife of abilities. Okay. That doesn't have a cost and instead actually is kind of like a benefit for more benefit. So I knew when I saw her, as soon as someone takes her ability and plays it with cards that, that are leveraging the negative cost mm -hmm. and the positive effect, they're going to do really, really, really well with her. Mm -hmm. um, so just looking at her, there's that. Um, the, the second thing about her is... Her first E, I know I said, forget about that one for a second. It's the thing that really pushes her into a flexible offensive position. Right? Mm -hmm. So her, her bottom E is just the Swiss Army knife of goodness if you build a deck around it. Her top E is something that can kill anyone at any time. Right? So you can take this, you draw this one attack hand, and you can decide, oh, it's going to get plus five damage because I'm going to play all these foundations first and then give it plus five damage. Right or something like that. Um, I guess it's just the flexibility of her first E, how it can be very useless, especially early in the game, or if you can only do one, or mm. it can be have infinite mm. ability. I guess it's very scalable. Okay. So I, I saw both of her abilities as mostly free and both very very flexible. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I can I can buy that. I can buy that she's a very versatile character. Um. Uh, Ooh, he's giving you the head nod of approval. Ooh, <laughs> like I, I guess not, I would, it's not the it's not the the face. If shape. I was to yeah, if I was to boil it down to one word, it would be uh, the flexibility of her yeah. abilities. Her yeah. she's a very flexible character. Yeah. She's not pigeonholed into one thing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, she'd be super nuts if she was speed and damage. Yeah, that'd be really good. That'd be mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah, people would be complaining about her over Quan Chi. So you know, but yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like we were we were talking to Barrett, and Barrett said that he had no issues yeah. with Quan Chi with Cassie because he would just mm -hmm. overrun Quan Chi. He'd just be like, well, I'll dump this giant damage attack yeah. on you and commit all these shadow inheritances, and yeah, you can't block it, so you die. Like I said, her scalability is yeah. is insane, yes. and that's one of the strongest parts of UFS. If you yep. can build a deck that can win early and late, yep. you're usually pretty good. Yeah, and she's kind of mid rangey. She's pretty hard to win with really early, just mm -hmm. because. You know, it's hard without being able to play four or five things into her state sure. card pool. Mm -hmm. But she also has the tools to do that. Like, yeah. that's, I said I didn't want to talk about support. But her support is what lets her be aggressive early as well. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely think that she has some of the better support in MK. Um, yeah. So. Yep. yeah. Definitely. All right. All right, look okay. at that. Look at that. We got a changed man, Garrett. Look at that. He is on the side of the light. There we go. If we're going to talk like that, that's be weird, yeah. <laughs> Hey, well, I told Barrett. I told Barrett. I was like, I was like, you know, Cassie's all right. I I think that uh, 
<laughs> I'm more comfortable saying that she's the best Shadow Inheritance deck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's what you told him. Yeah. Like, you won. Your character's all right. Yeah, it was okay. Like, I think that's like a a more compliment to him than anything else. I mean, like, yeah, Barrett's he I did very well. Yeah, yeah. I probably oh, yeah. played against Barrett in teams, just, and yeah. I, I mean, I guess that was the thing too. Is like when I played him, like that was the card I was most worried about was Shadow Inheritance. Mm-hmm. Like. You, you know, you start getting like two or three of those out, and it's pretty terrifying. Yeah. Well, like I said, I built my deck to target key foundations yeah. like yeah. Shadow Inheritance mm-hmm. and Champion Combat. Um, um, for sure. Right. I think. Um, and that's I guess her diggy as well. Like it helps you like find. You know, like you sort of were talking about like matchups and saying like, well, I want this against this, and I want this against that, and like she definitely will help you find the card you want for a matchup mm-hmm. yeah i mean the the big thing about her her e isn't about the digging itself it's about this part that says you may add one foundation reveal this way to your staging area and then add the remaining cards to the top of your deck in any yeah. order yeah. Mm-hmm. in ufs the more you can manage the unknown the better you're going to mm-hmm. do right so the fact that she can know what she's going to check either defensively or offensively or, you know, anything like that is what puts her uh, way above. And if you've played a lot of Plant Man or things like that, even Takeda, you'll you'll know how strong being able to do that once a turn can actually yep. be. Little it's, little uh, baby UFS house every turn? Yeah, right? that's yeah. exactly what I yeah, equated it to. It was like, she's baby UFS exactly. house. Yeah. She's baby UFS house, and UFS house was, was fantastic. insane. Yeah, it was I mean, insane, yes. Yeah, whether you combine it with draw, whether you combine it with just I want to check this, mm-hmm. it's an it's a it's amount of control that you can't really underestimate. Yeah. You can you can at first oh, you, you want to bet? You want to bet? Well, I know you can. <laughs> I, know you can. <laughs> I know you can, but I mean we're just going to have Devin give you decks again. And, you know, <laughs> that sounds good. That's I, I need, I need to play more decks that other people have tested so that they're not bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I was going to say before uh, we got cut off, like you, you shouldn't just play Sasquatch next time. You should actually take one of the decks. I tell you to play, you know, especially if it's one of Tim Keith's decks. I mean, oh, I know you could uh, you could you could be the U S NAS champ right now with Dalton with that Dalton <laughs> deck. <laughs> oh yeah. Not funny. yeah. Tim's Dalton. Could beat Cassie. Cass that deck's sick. It's yeah. sick. Yeah. yeah. All you gotta do is not check that wasn't that wasn't on the yeah. list of decks that I was offered. Well, that's because uh, we had already taken it. I mean, you gotta be the first first person at the trough, man. You gotta be, you gotta be the first <laughs> pig that you're getting there for good food. Okay. You, you gotta be if you know you don't have a deck, you gotta be asking. You know, weeks before. There you go. Yep. All right. Or usually, here right. next next time, just ask Devin. Devin, what deck did you abandon to play Jank at the last minute? <laughs> yeah, because right. he could have he could have won with his Satoshi deck. It it had a nine hand size, like hands yeah. down, nine hand size. Which yeah. symbol was he on? Void. Oh man. Oh, you would have loved his deck. He plays the Shadow Blade, you play Shadow Blade, it's eight speed mid for five, and then it, you draw when it clears and your Satoshi you draw. It's like I have a nine hand size now, or eight hand size with a clear card pool, and I just poked you. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's pretty sweet. Yeah, the only reason and, and if you're is stupid he, enough to block it, you just get frost hammered. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The rest was, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm like Devin, play the thing you you tested with it for two months before. Oh no, I'm not confident with it against Liu Kang. It's like really, <laughs> really. He's like, oh, I would play Ken. Oh. So just just come to me. To ask what did Devin abandon, and I'll probably give you a really good deck because it's probably okay. taken two months of building, and then he's just like throwing it out the window. You know? <laughs> I've done that before, it usually doesn't work out very well. It usually does. not uh, It's not funny. It's just horrible. Yeah, I, yep. I'll tell you, I I felt okay about my deck until I mean I had a couple losses by this point, but when I played against Slam and he was playing that Jet deck, and like I was just playing that matchup, and I was like, man, he does. Everything I do, but better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. I was like, well, oh well. <laughs> Bottom tables it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The thing about the Sasquatch is Sasquatch is great. I've said a lot going first. If he's going first, he's he's much stronger than going second. Mm-hmm. So he's actually a really interesting sideboard character for like a static guy who just needs a bit of speed. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, oh, it's time to go first because uh, I lost last match. It's game three. Side in the Sasquatch. Just commit them down, target commit them down, 
and just do the same thing only better because you you got to get ahead of them and stay ahead of them. Mm-hmm. So some characters are like that, but yeah. Yeah, I had uh, I I played against Slam and he built um two uh which one, uh sense of morals yeah. in turn one going first and I was just like, well, I'm gonna lose this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my only losses in the tournament were to Slam, the Raiden deck I built, and ultimately Heidi. But yeah. Slam beat me, most of my only loss in teams. Mm-hmm. And that's because that deck is actually super strong if it draws the right cards yes. and attacks at the right time. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, he triple missile launchered me, so he's well, done I mean, well. Me. I think that kills but most stuff. <laughs> it does kill most stuff. Yes. But it was also backed by a series of throws and. Like yeah. a very strong overall game plan, yeah. right? Yep. Yep. I think, yeah, and that's that's something I feel like too is that sometimes um, you'll have sort of like a deck that has like some good ideas, but doesn't necessarily have that like overarching like philosophy. And <clears throat> his jet deck, like, definitely like playing against that, and I was just like, this is a deck that definitely like has a lot more like purpose and sort mm-hmm. of like focus. Than like you know what I'm doing, and you know that was just sort of like yeah, definitely like playing against that, and I was just like, yep, like this is a deck that's good, mine is a deck that's not, and <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> no, I mean we've all been there. I mean most of us have been there. Come into yeah. a tournament with oh, a yeah. deck that we realize halfway through is just absolute trash, like yeah. hot garbage, yeah. and you're just trying to salvage the experience at that point. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So the, so the trick is to get other people to look at it beforehand and yeah. who are who are mean. Like the, the reason people ask me for deck advice is because I'm not a nice person. Yeah. And if, if they're the type of person that's like, oh, you can't change my mind, I insult them until they change their deck. Ah, right? the, like, so, so like the Phil Birch approach is the same way. Like he'll tell you this card's bad until you change your mind. So it's good to see that there's like-minded philosophy in the, in the UFS community. Cause I, yeah, I, I, I appreciate, I'm not, I appreciate I'm not as blatant more. about like this card is bad. Yeah. I, I usually try to put it in context of why it's bad in your sure, deck. Sure. I, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know yeah. there. Uh, <laughs> Phil, Phil Burke certainly told me multiple times that, uh, Dimension Door Ambush was bad, and that didn't make me stop playing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's because Phil Birch is wrong more often than me. It has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> we have the same philosophy, too, to helping people play the right cards, but he's just wrong more often than me. <laughs> um, what was that? Uh, I guess, like, a little aside. What was that Raiden deck doing? Um, I know I played a Raiden deck, and it was interesting. Like, I don't know. It, it felt like something that... It just didn't seem like terribly threatening, I guess, um, because like a lot of his, I guess, maybe it was just that he was running like some of the attacks that actually want you to also be below six, which mm-hmm. I think might not be the right call for Raiden. I think that his like free reading three is something that helps you a lot, like in the early game, but you don't want to like pin yourself because that's the thing is like if you're just at like six or seven foundations the whole game like you're you know you're gonna have trouble passing checks you're gonna have trouble blocking stuff like stun is gonna destroy you even mm-hmm. through the readying so yep and um, you're susceptible to a single bang or something yeah. like that that'll just ruin your day um his deck was doing what raiden normally does which is have a few attacks that are really good at the beginning and have a lot of attacks that are really good at scaling. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he went into deadlock against me. I went into deadlock against him in my game. Um, I did the math wrong is why I lost, but Raiden's a very good backswing character, right? Like mm-hmm. okay. even early on in the game, if you attack him and don't kill him because he's got the E that can clog your pool and all sorts of lovely stuff, he can get you over committed even if you build after that, right? Because you got the extra kind of breaker, kind of mm-hmm. kind of like the Hanya effect. Mm-hmm. Right. And then on his turn, he gets to ready three foundations, which really right. messes with the tempo and math of UFS. Like you're like, oh, he can't do anything. He's got four foundations. Well, no, he can probably do quite a bit depending on what he draws. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So, I mean, Raiden was just doing Raiden things, being sneaky. I think Raiden's a really good character. Um, I, I like him. I too. think he's one of those ones that, you know, like it's like you said, where he certainly isn't like a beginner character. Like no. there's all like there's a lot of choices to make, and yeah, like he definitely seems like somewhere where like an ill-timed like bang or revoke is gonna like lose you a game. Mm-hmm. But 
I kind of yeah. see him like as the Faye of the set in a way, because like Faye is so open ended that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, they're a very good comparison. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so because he's like I've tried to build a couple decks with him and I just get lost because I want to do too many things. Like I want to stay under, I want to stay about like six to seven to eight foundations, but I kind of want to have more because God of Thunder is broken. And it's fantastic. Yeah. I love that. Card. I do and I don't. Right. Like, yeah. That's, that's yeah. the problem. You yeah. do and you don't. You're playing right and. Yeah. You're one step forward, two step back. Yeah. You're kind of doing a dance, but mm-hmm. yeah. once you get it, if you hit the sweet spot, I think he could have. Like I wouldn't have been surprised if Raiden won. That's just because people aren't experienced playing against his style, sure. and they can underestimate him really quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Especially the people that don't play a lot locally and just have never played against it once at all. Yeah. And that's why I wasn't surprised he was three and zero. At the same time, I was three and zero because sure. I'm like, well, you know, he probably beat some scrubs. <laughs> and I beat. I beat three that I played against. Yeah. For the record. For the record. For the record. I did not play against a Raiden for the record. So, yeah, I was not yeah. one of those said scrubs. He's he's one of my favorite designs of Mortal mm-hmm. Kombat. I think Raiden is probably my favorite. Yeah, probably my favorite design. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cassie's a close second, but. Everyone else got to her first, so I refused to play her. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. But she's nifty, right? Like, I like characters that are just nifty. Mm-hmm. I also like higher hand size characters, though, so it's yeah. kind of hard to... Yeah. Even though both of those designs are amazing, it's hard for me to mm-hmm. fall in love with them. Because I'm the type of guy who put ten action cards in a deck and draw all five of them on turn one. Yeah. You know? yeah. And mulligan into four of them and be yeah. like, whoops, I lost the game. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, either of those characters are seven hand size. That's kind of that's really oh god, that's, yeah. oh god it's over. They, yeah, no, they can't be. Yeah, they can't be. Yeah. And that's why Quan Chi was so good was because he was this flexible monster and mm-hmm. seven hand size. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Like if you made him six hand size, he wouldn't be banned right now. Yeah. Hands down. I don't Probably. care if you give him twenty five life. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's just. Yeah. Anyways, that's that's a whole whole different mm-hmm. thing. Yep. There's more than one ways to balance a card. You can do it with hand size, vitality. And things like yin and yang, mm-hmm. like for God's sakes, why does that have a five check? <laughs> like, it could like really, why does that have a five check? Like, it could have or a why three. Does have, why does it have a two play. difficulty? Yeah, like, I don't get it. Yeah. I don't get it. Yep. No, like you could just number things right, and you can almost have any effect in UFS. Sure, but it's very hard to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, why is, why does his one div have a six check? Because <laughs> because six check things. I mean, it has fire could that on be it. a That's four? Why. Like it has fire on it. You know, free plus one minus one. Like what? <laughs> yeah. It is a fire. Yeah. It has fire. That's why. That's why it's a six okay. check. It has fire. It's fire's thing. Is six checks, man. Okay, a lot of his cards are just completely numer- numerical, like outliers, right? You got one sixes. Yep. You got two fives that He's have two amazing four. deadlock abilities and yep. amazing regular abilities. Mm-hmm. You got you got fatal disagreement is actually one of the best cards in the in the set of UFS right yep. now, and it's oh, yeah. his. Like you got every single card that's amazing. Oh yes. Yep. <laughs> Dark Emperor is okay. Yeah, it, it's Dark Emperor. Is that a two four no block? No, it's a two no, five no block. Five no block. Two five no block. But it's it's niche. Is is yeah. niche, right? It's like niche. Yeah. Depending on where the format goes, that is a sideboard card, almost mm-hmm. staple sideboard card. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, like all you do is you take Princess Perry and make it playable from the card pool instead of the hand, and that thing's going in every single deck. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. You know sure. what I mean? Oh like, yes, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But that Princess Parrot loses to Securing His Destiny anyway, so it's okay. So I'm just like, no. Yeah, yeah. Securing His Destiny is a great card. Yes. That's one, that, that and Loyal Friend have been moving up my <laughs> like list ever since like I've been seeing Tim play with it. And I'm just like, I'm dumb. Like, I don't, like, I, I, I'm still not at that level of, like, we did a show about card evaluation, and I still struggle with card evaluation. Like, I see a card with a noun block that says E flip, seal the foundation, and I'm like, it's okay, you know, it's not bad. But there's people who swear by it, and I'm, and I I like to absorb information from people who are better than me and smarter than me. So it's like, I learn and then I and then I apply. So yeah. Well, that comes back to what I was saying to tell the new players: like, yeah. try different things. Yeah. Right? Don't don't just be like I build and I don't use this card. Yeah. Exactly. Therefore, it's never good. Mm-hmm. The best part of this whole taking your opponent's deck and playing it is you you start getting in their head and you realize what they're thinking. Mm-hmm. And sometimes what they're thinking is correct or mm-hmm. at least it's definitely different than you, but it's yeah. something to be a better different, sometimes be a worse different. And it doesn't matter what it is. It's the why that it's better, right? Mm-hmm. So you got to take the next step. As you're just saying, you're playing with Tim's Colcon. You got to yeah. say, 
why is this impressive, yes. right? Like, why why is this E-flip seal sure. one impressive? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in his deck, it's because it interacts with other things mm-hmm. and because every turn is so important that if you can win one turn, mm-hmm. you can win the game with that Coca-Cola. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so if you can seal the right thing at the right time, you can... It's, it's worth a lot more yep. than otherwise. I right? no, so, totally agree. But the why, the why is the important part mm-hmm. of that. Yep. Those are some wise words from a wise man. Those are wise words. So uh, do you want to close out the episode? Because we're about, about we're a little over an hour and 20 minutes. So um, yeah. we'll close out the episode, Rob. Anything? Sure. Any, any final thoughts from you guys at all? Final thoughts? Any final thoughts other than that Cassie's probably the greatest character to ever walk through. <laughs> So. Whoa, 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 I would never say something. <laughs> oh, sorry, like sorry, sorry. Garrett Brett wrong. 1 was I'm really wrong. good. Garrett Brett 1 was fantastic. Okay, he was very good. Yeah. But yeah. Garrett Brett 1 is no jiffing. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, no. I mean, there's eight hand size characters, and then there's things that aren't eight hand size characters. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the way UFS is, right? Yeah. yeah. Definitely. <laughs> but you should have seen eight hand size Gil. It's basically jiffing, yeah. but with only three symbols. Mm hmm. Nice. Now, now we just have five hand size skill, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's five hand size. Wink, wink. Wink, wink. Nudge, nudge. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll get him banned. Don't worry about it. Cool. <laughs> That's fine. That works. That, that, that's like everyone's goal is to get something banned. You know? You know? I guess. It's, it's never my goal. It's just it's, it's bound to happen when sure. you when you play. <laughs> right? it's, okay. I mean, I, I don't think they'll ban Cassie, and why would they? Nah, nah, I don't. Nah. Think, I don't think she's. Like I said, I built a deck that I think has a very strong matchup against her. Mm-hmm. It's just a lot of people didn't, yes, right? Because exactly. she's she's hard candy. She's she's like the hard candy of UFS, where not everyone likes her. They mm-hmm. don't play her. They don't understand. Half the people have memed on her already, like Rob. Right? Like it's very easy to turn a blind eye. The funny part is, I've played Cassie. <laughs> like I played Cassie, and I went, "Wow, she's way better than I thought she was." Yeah. But you know, I'm still not going to sit here and go. She's definitely one of the better characters in MK. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Wait, my you get what I'm saying. From playing her, like yeah. for the the deck that I helped this guy like throw together, and I was like, "Man, Glow Kick doesn't suck. This card's pretty good." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Glow Kick yeah, seemed like the most boring thing of out of her card. Just like, ugh, combo fend, whatever. And then like I played it like once and it was like 17 speed and i was like this card's stupid <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Un- unblockable is actually an incredibly strong mechanic in your mm-hmm. <laughs> turns out yeah, anytime but- you can make it so your opponent can't interact it's pretty damn good mm-hmm. yeah all right so. cool so we'll end the episode um garrett thank you for coming on and uh, dropping the knowledge for us we appreciate it and convincing rob that cassie is a decent and wholesome character for everyone to like. So um, I believe uh, we have teams, uh, teams champs, Dave and Phil on the next episode of the Gal Treatment. Uh, Shoemaker is too cool and also too volatile. <laughs> I haven't yeah. asked him yet, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure if I ask him, he'll come on, and that would be a show and a half. I I'm sure he would. Yes, should. I'm pretty sure. Oh, I probably should ask him because it'd be nice. That's to That's kind of rude if you don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's also true. But I just assume he's doing better things with his life than actually talking on the internet with us. So, you know, I think Dave feels kind of obligated because we've had him on a few times, and Phil's only coming on so he can hang out with Kim half the time. So, you know, because him and my yeah. wife are like best buds, so they like they chat and stuff. So whatever. But, but yeah. So we appreciate it, Garrett, and we'll definitely uh, we'll have you back on, you know, and all that stuff. So uh, everyone, have a good evening. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Guile Treatment. Uh, don't forget to like, Thanks comment, for having me. Thanks for having me. It was a good time. Good night, everyone. <laughs>